Hi everyone, welcome to this M2 DT talk. Um, our speaker today is Albert Moussalian, and he's a PhD candidate at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Science. He is mainly interested in developing, accelerating, and applying novel machine learning method for realistic atomic scale simulation in material science, chemistry, and biology. He is also supported by the Department of Energy Computational Science Graduate Fellowship. Thank you so much, Albert, for um, coming here today to present your work. And uh, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Prudenzo. It's really my pleasure to be here today. I've been following this seminar for a while. Lots of lots of very interesting talks. It's it's great to have a chance to come and share some of what we've been working on with you all. Um, yeah, as, as Prudencia said, I'm a PhD student in the Materials Intelligence Research Group of Professor Boris Kaczynski at Harvard. Um, we are much more, I'd say, on the molecular modeling side of, of these two halves of, of the seminar. Uh, so I want to just start out with a bit of a, an introduction to some of the groundwork in that area, just, just for those coming from maybe a, a different background, just so we can all start on the same page here. And... The basic conceit of, I think, a great deal of molecular modeling work is that if you have a so-called potential energy function, if you have a mapping from the positions of a bunch of atoms, a bunch of just particles, to an energy, from this you can get an enormous amount of information about the system of particles. You can simulate its dynamics. That's what I'm showing a video of a, a particular system in the background. You can predict all sorts of materials and chemical properties that you might care about from a technological or scientific standpoint. So you have a lot of power here and a lot of promise for using computers as a microscope and as a design tool and as a, a tool for understanding the things we really care about it at the scientific and technological level. And a little bit more specifically, one of the most popular methods for doing this is molecular dynamics, which is this time evolution, the determining the dynamics of a system of atoms by repeatedly integrating the Newtonian equations of motion, so just simple classical dynamics, uh, under the given potential energy function. So you just make a little change, you take the forces, you use the derivatives of this energy to update the positions of the atoms, and you repeat this process over and over and over and over again, and you get the time dynamics of the system out. And you can learn all sorts of things from this. This is a very powerful technique, something people have been excitedly trying to apply across the material and chemical sciences for a while now. But of course, there are some, some caveats about what can you actually do with this. The first is that this time integration loop has to happen many, 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 many times because you need to get to physically meaningful time scales and comprehensive sampling. Another important caveat uh, has been that the potential energy function must be realistic. Obviously, if it is something you just completely made up, the results you get from dynamics governed by it will also be irrelevant to physical reality. Then the simulation also has to be large enough to represent the actual phenomena or systems or items that you care about studying. And, and there are many, many other caveats. And there's a reason I put out of infinity on this slide. But these first three have been kind of together a very difficult barrier to overcome for complete general workflows in this area. And this has been because we have, in the past, really two ways of approaching making a potential energy function. The first is to use full quantum methods or electronic structure methods. These are things like density functional theory, quantum chemistry codes, et cetera, that treat actually the electrons and the electronic degrees of freedom in the system explicitly. These are, broadly speaking, very accurate, very physically motivated. Um, they're often referred to as ab initio. They're not empirical uh, for most intents and purposes. Uh, with some exceptions, of course, but but at a high level, these are accurate, but they can't scale up. They're very computationally expensive, and they really can't do lots of atoms because their scaling is extremely super linear in the number of atoms. In fact, in usually the number of electrons or basis functions, depending on uh, the particular details. On the kind of opposite side, we've had classical force fields or molecular mechanics force fields. They go by a number of different names, which I suspect are very familiar to a lot of people in this audience since they've been extremely popular in biomolecular modeling. Since they can go big, they're very simple in terms of their functional form. It's just simple expressions of distances, maybe angles with some 
empirical parameterization. And so this means they're very fast and they can go very big. But in terms of accuracy, while, while some very good science has absolutely been done with these approaches, there, there's no systematic way to improve their accuracy. There is no obvious way necessarily to extend them to new chemistries or unexpected chemistries that it turns out you need to study. Um, and their accuracy with regards to experiment in general is just really limited by their mode of parameterization. And then what's emerged not even that recently in the field, is a hope to overcome this with machine learning. And the so-called machine learning potentials, which promise to be a sort of proxy model, uh, a more affordable surrogate for very accurate energies and forces that can maybe get us to a point where we have something that is accurate, but also fast and scalable. And as a machine learning problem, this is fairly straightforward. It's a supervised regression problem. We have some input structure like this little cartoon molecule I have on the left, some model, and I want it to predict an energy from which I can get the forces that govern dynamics using auto differentiation, analytical derivatives usually, um, and so on. And then we train this on training data from these more expensive, more accurate quantum methods. So we can take like triples, basically, you, in most cases, of, of a structure, an energy, and some forces from these highly accurate methods that we regard as ground truth, and we use this to build a training set. And again, the goal is to overcome the speed and scaling limitations of quantum methods. And just to give a bit of a, a framework for thinking about what I'm going to talk, talk about today, Day. For these machine learning potentials, data is critically important, which is why I put it first on the slide. As in anything in machine learning, what you can do, the quality of your predictions absolutely hinges on data. Um, but it also in this field really hinges on choices you make about model architecture. Because this is not a sort of uh, typical domain of data or predicted labels um, where very off the shelf architectures from general machine learning are gonna necessarily be the best choice. And then finally, it's a field where practical computational efficiency is absolutely critical. I think more so than the vast majority of scientific machine learning uh, areas because this integration loop we have in molecular dynamics really places all of the limitations onto how fast is this machine learning potential. So these practical details matter enormously. But the key point I want to make on this slide, well, the first is that I'm going to cover today uh, really the bottom two, uh, but also that these are not independent things. Yes, you can independently work on data sets, architectures, try to optimize them later, but, but really to get the best results, you have to take advantage of the ways in which architecture can affect what data you need, how much you need, how efficiently you can consume and leverage it. And also that you really can't optimize for efficiency in this scenario without starting from the very beginning in terms of considering your architecture. Um, the architectures absolutely determine what kind of optimizations can I make, what kind of computational resources can I leverage. And so this is a very kind of interdependent set of three things. And so now I want to go deeper into the model architecture point to begin with. One of the things that makes this an interesting machine learning problem is that the data in machine learning potentials obeys a very rich set of physical symmetries, not patterns we happen to notice in the data, not something that might or might not be true, but very fundamental inherent symmetries that are enforced by the underlying physics. Uh, for example, if I have, you know, my little uh, cartoon molecule still here, right, and I'm going to get an energy from it, if I rotate this little molecule in vacuum, that total energy is an invariant. It must not change under this symmetry transformation, this rotation. And so how to deal with this, how to build models that respect this law has been uh, an ongoing and very big, important question in the field of machine learning potentials. For a long time, the standard answer was to make so-called O3 invariant models. O3 here is the symmetry group of rotations and inversions, so the sort of most important and most non-trivial symmetries to deal with here. And the idea was to take things like distances between atoms or angles or other invariant descriptors that themselves do not change under symmetry operations and to only use 
keeps these as the inputs to the model. So then when I rotate my little cartoon molecule, those invariants don't change. And any predictions I make after that using a machine learning model are also invariant. All sorts of methods you may or may not have heard of fall under this umbrella. It was an extremely popular um, approach and the really standard for a, for a long time, including classical force fields, I would say, fall under this approach, basing their results on distances and angles. But what emerged uh, a little while after these invariant models was a richer, more powerful way of thinking about these symmetries and taking advantage of them. And that's O3 equivariant models. And the basic idea here is that when I transform my input structure, the internal features of my model transform correspondingly in some systematic, predictable way. So again, right, I'm rotating my little cartoon molecule, my internal features are transforming in the same way for some systematic definition of same. Oh, I also want to say, sorry, I meant to say this at the beginning. If you have questions, please feel free to interject at any time. Uh, doesn't have to be just at, at the end, happy to answer throughout. Um, and so just to sort of hammer home the difference that equivariance makes here, Imagine I have a model with no constraints, right? I just pick a multi-layer perceptron off the shelf. Then if I transform my, my input structure, that's going to rotate. My internal features are going to transform arbitrarily, and my predicted energy will also transform arbitrarily, which is not great. If I have an invariant model, if I transform my input, my internal features are invariant because they're functions of invariance, and so my final prediction will be invariant as we want. Finally, for an equivariant model, if I transform my input structure, my internal features transform correspondingly. And as a result, I can still extract an invariant prediction because the way they transform is systematic and predictable. How do we actually put this into practice? Well, the kind of first effort in this uh, from our group was the NIQIP model, which is an equivariant graph neural network for interatomic potentials and other applications. And this is a message passing graph neural network, which I suspect is very familiar to a lot of you in the audience, uh, which at its simplest just means that we have some fixed number of layers and at each layer, all the different atoms send out messages about themselves to their neighbors and take all the messages they get and assimilate them into their features. And what makes this equivariant in NIQIP is that these features aren't just piles of numbers, they have geometric structure. In particular, the messages and features are comprised of invariant scalars, but also vectors in the geometric sense and higher order geometric tensors. And this structuring gives us the ability to make an equivariant network. Just to give you a visual sense of that, these are actual vector features from an equip model as the input structure is being transformed. You can see how as we're rotating the system, the things transform correspondingly, almost boringly in a sense, because they are agreeing with our built-in physical intuition that physics in three-dimensional space, it doesn't depend on your choice of reference frame. But to actually encode that in a useful way for the computer and to build it into the machine learning architecture is quite non-trivial. So pretty picture, things rotating on the screen. Why do you care about any of this? Well, the answer, it turns out, is that we care because equivariance dramatically improves the practical results we're able to get out of machine learning interatomic potentials. Uh, so I'm going to go through some examples of Nequip with this, with our with our masco, mascot, excuse me, Nequipo the hippo. I also want to mention that uh, all of this uh, work on Nequip was uh, done in collaboration with my colleague Simon Batzner, who led all of the original Nequip project and efforts and, and made all of this happen. So uh, enormous credit, of course, to Simon. So one of the most striking things we discovered in equivariance is that it gives you generally better accuracy, but not just better accuracy, it gives you better data efficiency. Uh, so this is one example from the original liquid paper where on a liquid water system, we trained a model with about a thousand times less data than a previously published model and yet achieved significantly better force and energy errors uh, across the board, across various different phases of water. So, and again, this is going from order of 100,000 training frames, a very expensive proposition to generate, to 133, which is almost laughably small for a neural network in, in any field of machine learning, uh, and yet getting very good results. Um, and in fact, you know, we, we've seen that the, the good results aren't just errors, uh, like Nequip on water systems gets a good match to experiment. 
as well. But this isn't just a sort of a point thing that we notice that, oh, there's some system where there's an improvement in accuracy with less data. It actually turns out to seem to be more fundamental. Something that's been observed in general in the machine learning literature is that learning curves, that is how your error changes as you add more data, are power laws of consistent slope. So different architectures have different intercepts. They have different overall errors, but how good, how quickly they improve tends to be consistent. And what turned out to be the case with NEQIP is that if you build an equivariant NEQIP, the learning exponent gets better. You learn faster as you add more data. And so this is a, a very striking uh, finding, I think, and, and was really one of the biggest indications that equivariance is doing something kind of fundamentally right in this context. And then, you know, there was a lot of testing done, a lot of different works found that NEQIP generalizes very well across geometries. This is extrapolating to sort of unfamiliar conformers from a, a work we did with Gaborchani's group. Um, NEQIP extrapolates pretty well across chemical compositions. This is some work on lithium, um, lithium ionic liquids in, uh, various different concentrations, relative concentrations of the components, and showing how NEQIP generalizes well across these. Again, I'm not going into details of any of this. I'm happy to go into it uh, later if people have specific questions. Um, Shang Fu, uh, who did this really nice work, he's at MIT, called Forces Are Not Enough, found that NEQIP, as the equivariant model in a big comparison he did, was basically the, the only model that consistently yields stable and accurate simulations. Uh, when you actually dig into the quality of the simulations and don't just look at the test set errors. So what he's showing here on a water system again is a comparison with, with a, a lot of different invariant models um, and showing first up here the force errors where you can see Nequip has excellent force errors, but, but still a lot of them have pretty good force errors and none of them are bad. But that despite this, Nequip is by far the most stable in running MD and gets the best properties, despite similar force errors, when you actually look at predicted properties from molecular dynamics. Uh, also in this paper, for example, he found that on a sort of more complicated molecule, in this case, an alanine dipeptide system, in fact, NEQIP was the only potential that achieved stable molecular dynamics. So it's not just that the answers were better, it was the only one that even gave answers. So equivariance gives us a lot, empirically. And so again, NEQIP is a message passing equivariant graph neural network. There are a lot now of equivariant message passing graph neural networks for machine learning potentials. It's been an, an exploding field, lots of interesting work happening, you know, some names you may have heard of or may not have heard of, but the key point is that all of these are message passing networks. Ah, Prudencio, yes. Yeah, there was a question on the previous slide. Uh, how mm -hmm. is stability defined? That's a great question. Um, the exact details, I would have to double check, but I think what Chiang did was look at sort of the divergence of ensemble average properties. So I, I believe, don't quote me on this, it was the RDF uh, in both cases, possibly something else for the alanine dipeptide system and looking at basically how long do you go before the RDF goes insane from a, a stable baseline, um, which is, as he points out in the paper, actually a pretty generous criterion for exploding, um, since a lot of things can sort of start to quietly go wrong before kind of these windowed averages and such will, will show it. But I believe that's the criterion. Um, and this is described in, in full detail in the methods of, of this archive um, that I have listed at the top. He also goes into a lot of detail on, you know, sort of what happens when things explode. There's some nice plots in there. I don't have them in the slides of like, you know, conformers that go very out of domain and then some force becomes enormous and then atom moves fast and then everything else sort of goes out of domain and there's a cascade effect and everything goes sort of wrong from there. So there are a lot of different ways of detecting these uh, events, but generally it's pretty obvious once things have completely gone boom. I'll keep going ahead, but again, please feel free to um, chime in with any questions. So, okay, we have a lot of positive results on our on this message passing equivariant graph neural networks. In fact, all the equivariant efforts to build potentials are message passing graph nets. 
Um, but there's a bit of a problem with this, which is that in a message passing network, every layer increases the effective cutoff in a conflated way with your model capacity, your depth, all these things are interlinked and you can't really control them separately. What does this mean in practice? Well, for a silly little example, for here's liquid water. And here's what a six angstrom cutoff around that oxygen atom looks like. And that's a pretty reasonable cutoff. That's fairly typical for a lot of applications. You have about 96 neighbors here. Okay, if you had a one layer message passing net, you would actually have 96 neighbors. But if you have two layers, this is your effective cutoff. It doubles. If you have, say, six layers, which is not an atypical um, hyperparameter for the vast majority of message passing networks, this is your effective cutoff out of 36 angstrom with about 20,000 effective neighbors. And an immediate consequence of this is that message passing really doesn't parallelize well. So we know from everything I showed, a lot of other experiments and evidence that Equivariance seems to be really helpful in this field. But is message passing something we really need to keep? And our answer to this question was Allegro, a strictly local deep learning equivariant model architecture. Um, what I'm going to show here is sort of a mishmash of stuff from two papers, from the original Allegro paper and a more recent preprint uh, discussing some further advancements, scaling, and experiments. All of the work on Allegro was done in equal collaboration with my colleague Simon Batzner once again, and would, none of this would have been possible also without my colleague Anders Johansson. Um, so everything I'm going to show you is, is stuff that we were working on um, and that we're very happy to be able to share here. So how did we go about building a strictly local deep equivariant model? What architectural choices right, did we make to get away from the sort of existing graph model paradigms that were proving very limiting for simulation? There were a few key choices we made that I'm just going to go through one after the other. The first is in regard to decomposition. In a conventional graph neural network, and in fact, most machine learning potentials, the decision is made to decompose the potential energy of the system into a set of atomic energies, EI. Um, so we have you know, a bunch of atoms. They have their features, HI here. And somehow from their features, after doing some set of updates, we're going to predict an energy for each atom and sum them up. In Allegro, we make a, a very different choice, which is to make a per-ordered pair decomposition of the potential energy. So the total energy becomes a sum over energies associated to ordered pairs of atoms ij. And as a consequence of this, we also do all of our features on ordered pairs. So rather than having features on atom i, we have features associated to the ordered pair ij, and a different set of features for the atom pair Ji, and it's important that it's an ordered pair and that it's not symmetric. So this is the sort of first key architectural choice you made, and you'll see why this becomes important in a moment. The second one was to build a, what we call the two-track architecture. You'll remember at the beginning, I, I, I made the point that you can't just optimize these sorts of things after the fact. Our need to make these things fast and efficient means we have to think about this from the start. And one of the big difficulties that's been faced with equivariant networks is that, you know, if you want to operate on tensors, right, you could only use certain equivariant operations. And these tend to be, in addition to non-trivial to implement, they tend to be rather poor fits uh, for existing software and hardware that's available for us in machine learning. On the other hand, invariants are just numbers. You can do anything you want to them. So you can do very cheap, very high capacity, efficient machine learning on them. And so we made this explicit split into a scalar and tensor track or an invariant and an equivariant track in the Allegro architecture because scalars are cheap and tensors are expensive. So we're gonna let a lot of scalars control a very small set of tensor operations to get the benefits of equivariance, hopefully at less cost. But how do we actually pull this off, right? We have we have these layers, right? Here it just says layer. And so what we have in there is we have some number of Allegro's tensor product layers uh, that do some very carefully put together uh, interactions in the tensor track to actually update the features on these ordered pairs. And so the goal of each of these layers is, is twofold. The first is to interact the tensor features that live on these different pairs of atoms and because you know, we want to have interactions between atoms. And the second is to interact tensors of various types. 
And so for this, we use an operation called the tensor product or the tensor product of representations, really, which is the most general equivariant bilinear operation. I'm not going to go too much into the details of this. Uh, suffice it to say that this is really, by every indication, the most fundamental operation in Klebsch-Gordon or irreducible representation, however you want to call it, uh, equivariant neural network formalism. And so what we do is we basically frame this layer, this update step, as a tensor product between tensors on one pair of atoms and tensors on a different pair of atoms. So right here, ij, ik. And then we use this to update the features on the pair ij. And so we have some weighted sum over this, and this captures correlations between the different neighbors. And this lets us capture many body interactions and higher body order terms in the expansion of the energy. But this on its own is not particularly efficient. So we make uh, some further uh, substitutions here. And we look at this and we say, well, we carefully choose the indexing so that we can take advantage of the bilinearity of this tensor product operation to move around the weighting in this weighted sum over tensor products with different atom pairs to turn it from a tensor product between pairs, which scales poorly, into a tensor product between something that lives on a pair, which is great, and another thing that lives on the environment of a single central atom to reduce the number of tensor products we have to do in each layer. So when we do this, we now only need one tensor product per layer, which is still an expensive operation. That second paper I mentioned that I'm pulling from, uh, we put in a lot of efforts to optimize this much further and to take advantage of this uh, kind of shrinking of how many tensor products we need to do to even drive down further how much computational expense this imposes. But none of that sort of more in the weeds computational work would have been possible without kind of making these fundamental architecture choices in an attempt to enable the sort of optimization work. Finally, the most important thing about Allegro's update. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So you're talking about having this large receptive field and that being a problem computationally. And now you're talking about pairs, which if done naively increases your computation because now you have to take every single pair in there. So can you tell me a little bit more about how you define these pairs uh, to have these representations? Absolutely. That's a great question. So we only handle pairs within uh, a cutoff. So we only consider a pair to exist if the atoms are within some you know user-defined system-dependent cutoff distance. And then the, the key thing on the scaling with that, the first is this, this density trick thing that I just showed, where we go from having to take all of the combinations of pairs to taking combinations of pairs with single atoms to implicitly get uh, combinations of pairs. That's the first key difference. A, a sort of smaller point is that in message passing networks, in fact, you still do operate at a pair level. Uh, in really anything, you have to operate at least at a pair level generally um, if you're going to explicitly treat atoms because the fundamental unit of interaction, you can't build interactions out of single atoms. You have to build interactions out of at least pairs. Uh, the only exception to this is when you don't treat individual atoms at all in like atom density representations. But if you're going to treat individual atoms um, and their interactions with each other, you kind of have to deal with pairs it's just a question in my mind of sort of how much do you commit to it in a sense. In a message passing network, you treat pairs to build messages, which tends to be in the equivariant models where the vast majority of the capacity and computational expense actually lives. And then you sort of pool them onto atoms. Uh, in Allegro, we're still dealing with pairs, but we're saying we're just gonna stay on pairs. Um, we're just going to keep this level of granularity and we're going to make some other choices like this uh, arrangement for the density trick in order to get the exact same asymptotics in terms of scaling. Yeah, so I think, you know, a lot of people in, in this group uh, are used to the message passing pairs being like bonds, which obviously doesn't make much sense here. And so for equivariant networks, they've seen people, uh, you know, you, you can use like a distance cutoff, like anything within whatever, some angstroms you can consider a pair. I've seen people use things like Bessel functions to consider, you know, how, whether or not to consider something a pair. Is that going into this as well? Or is it just sort of anything within, you know, whatever 
user defined angstroms can be considered a pair, but like you said, you're not then aggregating that to the atom level, you're keeping the pair uh, uh, features themselves. That's exactly correct. Uh, generally, yeah, we just use a single cutoff radius, though actually I don't have a slide on it in here. It seemed a little too in the weeds. In the this sort of second effort when we were working on optimization and for some of the results I'll show later, we actually take advantage of this pairwiseness to not look at bonds. Um, I think it's very important, you're right, to note that you know, this is not like when you're doing, I think, a lot of chemical property prediction where you do message pass along a bond topology, we have no bond topology. Um, one of the great advantages of that is that we have done all sorts of successful simulations of reactive systems without needing to ever explicitly say, this is when a bond does or does not exist. Um, so really we're talking about pairs established by proximity and with some sort of smooth cutoff, that means that you can even in your head, if you want to view it not as a discrete entity, but as that there are pairs between all atoms in the system, just at some distance contributions smoothly go to zero. And so you can effectively in practice, ignore those pairs. So it's very much not the discreteness of the pairs is, is very much a coincidence of the computational uh, details at a philosophical level. Yeah, we really just have lots of atoms interacting with each other with some interaction cutoff. And that interaction cutoff can take advantage, uh, this is what we did in this later work, of this pairwise granularity of the indexing to actually do some interesting variable cutoffs where you can say that sort of certain chemical species, you're going to cut off not their interactions, but their contributions in different directions at different distances in order to improve your computational performance in some cases by a great deal. Uh, I think we, we saw like three X improvements in many cases without any change in accuracy, but just at a more granular level saying, I want I to contribute to J at some longer distance, but I only want J to contribute to I at some shorter distance based on their chemistry, for example. Um, I have a related question, and we've been chatting about this uh, on the side uh, without agreeing. <clears throat> so you mentioned to motivate all this that you don't want to have the whole network to have large neighborhoods per atom due to the composition of all the layers, if I understood properly. And you said that was a bad thing, but uh, could you explain why? Absolutely. Um, let, me, let me go back there for a moment. So I think... There are, there are a few different challenges here. The first is a little bit fundamental. Uh, and this is almost a, a philosophical reason why you don't want this, which is that in a message passing network, you cannot independently control the cutoff, the depth, and the capacity of your network. These are just invariably intermingled. So you have very little ability to understand or control your cutoffs, which is a very fundamental physical why would you want to limit? Parameter. Why would you want to limit the cutoff? For parallelization. Um, also occasionally for physics, but so mainly how, how for is that hurting parallelization? I don't get it. If you do a message passing network at a low computational level, you have to do a message passing implementation in the, for example, MPI sense. If you want to massively parallelize across nodes, multiple GPUs, you have to keep up with all the communication overhead. You have to propagate the messages across GPU boundaries in the forward pass. You have to propagate the gradients the other way in the backwards pass, which we use in inference. That's, I think, something that's um, very okay, different. So you're saying at, at, at runtime, uh, when we have different groups of atoms uh, mm -hmm. implemented in, in the big neural net on, on different uh, nodes, computation nodes, um, it'll be more expensive to do the synchronization or the communication between those nodes. Exactly. Making parallelization not work so great. Exactly. Okay, that's that's a clear explanation. Thanks. And no matter how cleverly you do that, it's sort of a fundamental overhead. You can do, make it better, but you can't eliminate it. So are you saying that currently though, I mean, we, we need parallelization in order to implement this on large scale also, right? Yes. Typical workflows for classical potentials or even simpler non-equivariant machine learning potentials almost always use at least multiple GPUs, if not multiple nodes. In particular, as I'll show in a moment here, in biochemical systems where the just inherent length scales are pretty big, you, there's just, 
you need a lot of atoms to represent even a small protein in water. And this, for decent speeds, really requires parallelization over often massively large GPU resources. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very, very important question. Thank you, everyone, for kind of bringing this up now. Um, and that's actually a perfect segue into the next slide I was going to discuss, which is that the kind of most important property in this main update equation and the most important reason in many ways for this pairwise decomposition is that by choosing how we set up the indexing of the terms that appear in the update equation, you can notice here that all pair indexes share the same central atom index. And that the consequence of this is that no information from beyond the neighborhood, that is the atoms that neighbor atom I, goes into this equation. Nothing comes into this physical piece of space from outside. There's no informational dependency. And as a result, the Allegro architecture is strictly local, uh, which is exactly what we were just discussing and what enables um, a lot of parallelization for applications. Before I get to those examples, I just wanted to show briefly that this doesn't kill your accuracy. This doesn't seem to damage the things we're really happy that we're getting out of equivariance. Um, some examples, some you know, familiar benchmark data sets, um, matching basically NIQIP on MD17, uh, good generalization on 3BPA, which is a conformal generalization benchmark for a small drug like Molecule. Uh, we got state-of-the-art accuracy on QM9 for the, the energy properties, including with one layer of this Allegro model, um, which I think really goes to that point of cutoff versus capacity. Um, with Allegro, these things are pretty much independent. Uh, there have been, you know, I don't have a slide on it here, but uh, some very promising efforts on QM9 have been incredibly deep. Some of them, there was an effort even that went to like 10 layers of message passing because this seemed to be a way to increase capacity. But it turns out that if you kind of decouple these things and in Allegro, you can just put all the capacity into the scalar track, uh, even in a single layer, you can decouple what sort of geometric interactions you need, what sort of geometric capacity from what sort of representational capacity you need in terms of what actually atoms and neighbors do I see. And you can decouple this again from actually, you know, how much just machine learning capacity do I have? How many weights? How wide are my MLPs? How deep are they? These are all independent things. And by controlling this, it turns out that the level of complexity in terms of geometry or what it suggests about the underlying physics that a lot of earlier machine learning approaches suggested with saying, oh, you need this like incredibly complicated web of uh, interacting atoms, some, you know, massive body order, massively high correlation thing to handle this. Maybe not. Maybe that isn't actually the complexity of the underlying data. Maybe we just needed a way to increase capacity without changing all these other things as well. Uh, two other examples I'll briefly give on the accuracy front. We've done experiments in, in material science, for example, on solid state lithium ion electrolytes, reproducing structural properties and the diffusive motion of the lithium within this structure, which is very important for battery applications. Um, some collaborators and, and friends of ours have gotten very nice results that they, they put up uh, in part recently, uh, matching actually experiment using Allegro, doing path integral molecular dynamics of liquid ammonia. There are many other ongoing projects. Um, we still get better accuracy at much less data. This is that water thing I showed you earlier, the same train split, like exact same frames, same training set. Um, here we're going now between the previous invariant method now and Allegro, 133,000 training frames, 133. And you can see we still get a better accuracy despite much less data. So we're preserving all these benefits of equivariance, but did we really need message passing? And and I hope that you're also somewhat convinced at least that, that the answer might in fact be no. And what we can then do with this and what really excites me um, is that we can scale up. So what I'm gonna show you now is from our most recent preprint to kind of close. Uh, I hope that this is interesting to this crowd. I think it should be since it's in the biomolecular domain. Um, an example of how this change in architecture and the scaling it lets us do 
works and what it could let us do in terms of scientific simulations uh, and learning very complicated data sets. So to step back to data for a moment, you know, like I said at the beginning, right, of course, behind anything we do in machine learning for science is what data do we have? I want to just explicitly um, call out this really nice data set effort that was uh, has been recently released called the SPICE data set. This is a data set of small fragments, basically, of single peptides, dipeptides, various small organic molecules, dimers of small organic molecules, individual small organic molecules in vacuum, like simple small systems with lots and lots of different conformers and a ton of energy and force data computed with consistent density functional theory settings at very high quality. So this is a very nice effort from, from this whole group of people to put together a data set for hopefully training things that can be fairly general on biomolecular systems. But again, the key point here is that this is fragments. Um, there is nothing in here in terms of proteins bigger than a dipeptide. There is nothing in here that resembles a box of water. There are pairs of water molecules, but that's it. Um, so it's really uh, a very kind of minimal data set in that sense, despite the fact that it's over a million frames, which sure, to a computer vision person, that sounds like nothing for the size of a training set. But in our field, that's largely the exception. Um, it's major data set efforts only that sort of reach these kinds of large scales with a great deal of chemical diversity, right? You can see there's a lot happening in this data set. So presumably, we're going to need a lot of capacity. And this uh, you know, was something I meant to talk about, but it calls back to the conversation we were just having. Again, this issue of what kinds of capacity do we want and how can we control them independently is that we went ahead and trained an Allegra model on this data set. And we were able to choose, um, unfortunately, I don't have a graphic for this, but we were able to choose hyperparameters such as to limit um, the sort of level of geometric and interaction complexity we wanted to handle. We could choose a certain distance cutoff. We could choose even smaller distance cutoffs, as I was mentioning, for certain interactions, uh, in particular in liquid water that gained us massive performance. But we could do this all while still maintaining a great deal of capacity in the sense of weights in the MLPs inside of the Allegra model, even though it had a limited number of Allegra layers and a limited amount of geometric complexity that seemed to be enough for this application. And those MLPs are just enormous math models, right? This is what GPUs eat for lunch, not the extremely complicated tensor operations that when we scale those up, it really hurts us on performance. So that's another very important aspect of this. But so what I want to show first is that we trained a model on this data set of fragments, and we were able to scale up to completely unseen in the training data, large proteins, all atom in explicit water and run stable MD. So what I'm showing here is for two proteins from the uh, AMBER benchmark suite, uh, DHFR and factor nine, uh, we're showing them systems here with water and ions omitted just for sake of visualization. But these are boxes entirely solvated with all atom water and ions. So and again, in the training data set, there is no box of anything. There is no protein bigger than two residues. And we were able to run with the model trained on this uh, stable MD, fairly long time scale in the context of machine learning potentials, um, and with you know getting stable predictions. Nothing broke apart. At no point did this longer peptide chain decide there are no long peptide chains in the data. I'm just going to split and go insane. Everything stayed um, exactly as we would hope and expect with just stable RMSD and temperature, no lost atoms, nothing. Again, completely unseen. So this was very exciting to us as sort of an early indication that these sorts of workflows um, might be possible for extending scientifically to the kinds of systems that were never possible with density functional theory. Not that we're slow, not that we're a little too big, but the ones that are just completely unapproachable. Then we also did a lot of uh, measurement and optimization work on scaling this in terms of computational resources. Um, at a theoretical level, an Allegra model scales linearly in the number of atoms. Great. Um, con in contrast, actually, to some machine learning methods, though the most are linear scaling. Linear in the number of neighbors. That's the density trick stuff I was showing you earlier and relevant to the question that was asked. 
this is actually not necessarily quite as common. A lot of machine learning potentials that try to uh, do deep learning end up having um, M squared complexity because they do some sort of uh, attention, full full quadratic attention, or some kind of explicit treatment of triplets of atoms rather than pairs. Um, so this is actually um, an improved scaling in many cases, and completely fixed scaling in the number of chemical species. There's no combinatorial explosion like the explicit descriptors like SOAP or ACE have, which is really important in something like this SPICE data set where, you know, you saw back here, right, there's a lot of different chemistry going on. And this scaling doesn't just exist in principle. It's not just something we say can happen asymptotically. We've actually managed to um, put it into practice at large scales. So the first thing I want to show here is the strong scaling results. Strong scaling um, in this context refers to turning resources into speed, being able to say, I want to run a simulation of this thing. I want to keep throwing more and more GPUs at it and see how fast could I make my time to solution by throwing more GPUs at it. And this is what I really want to emphasize. You can't even do this with any current software implementation I know of for a message passing potential. In principle, you could do it slowly, as we were discussing. But in practice, I don't know of any instance where it has or can be run on more than one GPU. On the other hand, leveraging this strict locality, we are able to do strong scalings out to, in this case, 1,024 nodes, which are four A100s each. This is an enormous amount of computational resources on NERSC's Perlmutter. Um, and what you can see that's uh, the sort of most important feature here is that across a wide variety of system sizes and systems, by throwing more resources at the problem, we're able to improve time to solution. And that's something that was just not possible uh, practically with any message passing potential. Previously, this just wasn't something you could do. You couldn't take the accuracy of these deep learning equivariant potentials and do this. Even if you built the slowest one, you couldn't make it faster, even if you had as infinitely many GPUs to throw at the problem. We also looked at weak scaling, which is a measure of how much basically length scale uh, goes up as you would hope as you add resources. So in principle, because everything is linear scaling here, these lines should be completely flat in an ideal perfect platonic world, where as you add more and more atoms and you add correspondingly many GPUs, everything stays the same. In practice, of course, this is never true for any code, but we were very pleased to see that we still have very good weak scaling results. And that, again, in, in, in large part because of how we adapt the architecture to the realities of internode communication, the communication overhead is not bad at all. So it doesn't impose a terrible decline in efficiency as we do this joint scaling between resources and length scale. Um, I have a related question uh, mm -hmm. to the previous one I, I asked uh, concerning the parallelization based on what you're talking about with the linear scaling. So, um, do I understand correctly that the reason you're able to parallelize so uh, nicely is because you're not having a very deep, uh, deep system, that the number of layers is small and thus the um, effective cutoff uh, is, uh, is small. And so that allows you to parallelize uh, at a finer grain. Is that what's going on? Not quite. For a message passing network, that would be true. That if you could get away with fewer layers, you would pay yeah. less to parallelize. In our case, we've completely eliminated the change no, in the, stuff with the number I of I don't layers. see that. I don't see that because the Vs, at v, the Vs at I depend on the Vs at Js. But then if you if you stack another layer of the same kind on top, um, then the, the neighborhood size will grow, right? Well, it's this is where the indexing gets a little bit subtle. I mean, you're absolutely right that if that were the case, we would have message passing in a sort of roundabout way, and this would be true. The, the key point here is that ordered pairness and the fact that the ordered pairs are not the same. Um, oh, I see. So I, okay, so the I, K here are specific to I, and so they don't need to be shared across uh, GPUs or whatever. Exactly. Everything with the I in the first index is completely independent from the things with the I in the second index. And this breaks that data dependency. 
Okay, got it. Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, yes, so with this, that's exactly what gives you the, uh, in principle, perfect linear scaling, and so it should give you the weak scaling. The final weak scaling thing I want to show, uh, just as a, as a demonstration and an illustration, you know, biomolecular systems contain a lot of atoms. I don't think I need a citation for that. Um, and sort of the more complicated the things we want to simulate, the bigger they are. Now, this is not necessarily routine, but sometimes it might be necessary. And sort of, it's not just about running like water at this many atoms. There are real all atom models people are building and hoping to do science with that are at this scale. And so one of the experiments we ran for the weak scaling was a uh, 44 million atom structure of the HIV capsid. So this is 44 million atoms of many, many proteins. This is an assembly of proteins um, in full all atom solvent with ions. Um, got the structure from the paper I've listed at the bottom. And so, you know, we're able on massive computation resources, yes, but I mean, we're able to scale this equivariant accuracy and stability and all these desirable properties to this scale that just could not be reached by any of these leading deep learning potentials before. And this is really what we hope will enable people to do science at these scales that they, they couldn't before, um, both through the improvements in time to solution, the improvements in system scaling size. Um, you know, by no means uh, can I say that we know where this is going to go, which exact simulations uh, at this scale are going to be important, whether, you know, the exact data set and method of training we used for this demonstration is going to be what gets us there as a field. This is where you know, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to talk to this crowd, because I think this is, this is the crowd of people who are really committed to bringing machine learning and this cutting edge um, sorts of architectures and approaches to bio, the my biomolecular world. Um, but we're really very hopeful and very excited about now having this capacity to scale these types of methods to these sorts of scales, these sorts of scales in terms of data, this sort of generalizing up in data. And we really hope that this demonstration uh, gets other people excited and interested in what we can now come together as a community to move forward and do scientifically with these abilities. The last thing I want to just say on that point is just to mention for any of those who might be interested, all of this tooling, all of this software infrastructure is available. It's out there for you to use. We have our NEQIP framework in general for equivariant atomic machine learning. On top of this, we have the NEQIP architecture that I mentioned the Allegra model architecture, various other extension packages. This is integrated with the uh, LAMPS Massively Parallel Molecular Dynamics Code, which all of the uh, results I showed you today were done out in LAMPS, but we also have integrations with actually quite a few other codes at this point, the Atomic Simulation Environment, OpenMM, which I know is um, very popular in the biomolecular world, recently also CP2K, uh, Nickwip and Allegra have been integrated into that for running simulations. Um, again, there's a, a growing ecosystem around this of sort of all the different tools you need in, in the machine learning workflow, um, attempts towards uncertainty quantification, uh, data set development and generation and active learning tooling, uh, all sorts of other things. And we hope, of course, your work. Um, the reason we build this is that we want to see, we want to see these techniques hopefully have a, a real impact in computational science, computational chemistry materials and biochemistry, we, we want them to be useful to people. And so, you know, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about all of this. With that, I would just like to, of course, thank everybody who has worked on these projects, all my co-authors um, and lab mates, uh, people who worked on the last two papers I showed you shown, shown above, of course, all of our sources of compute and funding. And last of all, all of you for your attention, your questions, I'm happy to take any other questions now. Please feel free to reach out by email at any point as well if you have questions, want to discuss, ideas, whatever. Uh, thank you all so much.
Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Albert, for the for the great talk, Daniela, today. Um, you can go to question. If you have any questions, please just raise your hand and jump in. There's one question in the chat by Joshua. How many GPU was needed for the HAV capsid uh, simulation? Mm -hmm. uh, great question. So capsid is the one shown here in the plot. So we ran uh, for this between uh, 512 and a little bit over, I'm not remembering what the exact number is, a little bit over 1,024 nodes. Uh, the nodes on Perlmutter are four A100s each. Um, one question from, from me. Um, because in Allegro, you have kind of constrained the system on fully to just only take up uh, local interaction. Aren't you aware that you won't be able to generate some system that require long range interaction? Like if you talk about, for example, reaction, uh, you cannot understand reaction purely based on local interaction. So, and there are other kind of material science um, system which require this long range interaction. So, how, what's your take on that? And how can Allegro be modified or used in, in that settings? It's a great question. Um, the first thing I'll, I'll say to that is that you'd be surprised at how often when learning DFT data, it doesn't matter. We've been surprised. I think the whole field has been surprised um, at just how often when you think you would really need long range interactions, it turns out you don't. Um, so generally, I would say it's not, it's not a given that you need it, but obviously there are going to be systems where you do. And in that case, I'm actually of the opinion that this strict restriction to a entirely user-specified interaction cutoff is very helpful in this regard. Because really, when you want to take into account long-range interactions, you're trying to do a scale separation. You're trying to say, I want to treat differently, generally, some sort of long-range electrostatics, dispersion sort of interaction for which we know a lot about the physics of this. Uh, and I want to separate this from my consideration of local interactions. This is what classical force fields do, right? They assign point charges generally, and they do some sort of particle mesh Ewald, and that's a completely separate energy term, right? So I think that the locality actually facilitates this because it facilitates cleanly and comprehensively making this range separation and allowing you to, in a much more principled way, integrate your local model with one of the many different approaches to long range interactions that we've seen in the literature, whether that's something as simple as just assigning partial charges and doing PME, um, doing some sort of global charge equilibration scheme. I know there have been you know, some very interesting efforts in this direction. Uh, I've seen a paper on doing sort of a secondary energy term um, in reciprocal space sort of inspired by Ewald sums, but not actually doing an explicit Ewald sum. So I'm very much of the opinion that you know, these are going to be the tools that solve long range interactions when necessary, because these are the tools that incorporate the physics that can actually correctly handle periodic boundary conditions, deal with the symmetries in, in insane ways, rather than just sort of washing out nth degree neighbor information from six hops away that, frankly, we don't even know that it can easily be learned from without overfitting um, in certain I believe there's even been some evidence in certain cases that you can't be. Um, so that's that's my general take is that absolutely the long range is important, but the way we handle the long range is going to be by range separation. And you can't range separate unless your short range machine learning model actually has a defined interaction. Okay, perfect. Um, one question regarding uh, the, the fact that DFT in most cases, like, when you have short range system, you are on network, you're able to uh, to have very good accuracy on DFT. Do you think it's mostly a function of DFT itself? Because like, I know with other system, if it, were, it was a CS CSID kind of data, maybe sometime like the machine learning system with short range interaction failed. Um, but DFT, yeah, I, I realized that as well. So this is mass mostly a function of DFT or is there something else at play here that we don't understand yet? That's a great question. Um, I believe there has been some study of this. Unfortunately, I, I cannot for the life of me remember who it might have been or where I might have seen it. If I dig it up, I'll send it to you. It, it's possible. It's certainly possible um, that, that it, it depends. In particular, you know, 
depending on your choice of functional, obviously certain DFT functionals at some level impose a greater long range dependence than others. Um, that's certainly the case. In a lot of systems, I do think it is fundamental physics in the sense of when you're in you know, liquid solvent or you're in the solid bulk rather than like something like this, there's a lot of screening. There's just a lot of screening and there's a lot of isotropy. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot to just wash out, balance out or eliminate long range interactions, I think at the fundamental physical level. But certainly I, I, I entirely believe that there will be systems where, where it turns out to be important, absolutely. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? If so, just come up here then. A follow-up question about long-range interactions. So actually for biological systems like virus, I'm not sure if you were familiar with previous work to nature wake up state like Joan Pirilla and this kind of people, you know, almost a decade ago when they, they were simulating these big systems. And, you know, my intuition is that it's actually like specifically for this, like for on a small scale, when you're simulating, you know, like atoms and molecules, yes, you can get away with local interactions. Like that, that totally makes sense. But, you know, I'm not yet fully convinced that, you know, is that you can get away from electrostatics and the long systems. And uh, primarily because, you know, like there are this like big, you know, particles that can orient each other. And specifically, like, I think one of the conclusions, like, uh, Joan Perilla was specifically studying HAV capsid assembly, and he was studying, like, partial capsids, you know, and there he specifically was showing that these long-range interactions, uh, they were important, like, you know, specifically electrostatic was important for capsid assembly because, you know, like, what happens there is that existing capsid, it's like a huge, huge system, so it happens to be polar. And when the next protein wants to join it, it's basically, you know, on a longer time scale, on a very long time scale with this big particle, it assembles, you know, basically it correlates at how this bigger, like gigantic particle will drift. So, you know, basically my follow up question is, you know, like, A, um, would it make sense to, you know, maybe think about electrostatics, but do it in a way where, you know, it's not many terms if you think about this, you know, maybe these are, are global interaction terms but they have a very, very tiny amount of weights. So the communication of electrostatics is extremely sparse, right? So like people do with, with you know, they, they usually computed in a frequency domain, you know, with, with PMEs and like, you know, my intuition would be that, you know, in, like it, it, it's, you know, at least how physicists represented the system as non-local systems, you know, and trying to basically have a very, very sparse communication over long distances. So that makes sense. And second thing about basically a message passing framework, because I'm just looking at the, you know, it's like super naive because I've been like really far from the simulations. Uh, but to me, this seems like, you know, like when I'm looking at message passing, is this fundamentally right framework? Because like when I'm seeing these physical systems, you know, message passing, they were initially meant for like Facebook and this kind of stuff, and you don't know the connectivity. But for this, you know, atom simulation, you have connectivity, which is almost like CNN, you know, you have a certain number of atoms in every voxel. Right. And then, you know, you, you can say I can have only as many atoms per voxel and then you can basically index everything by voxels. And that seems like, you know, and if you don't have enough atoms, you just have empty voxels and then you trivially parallelize, you know, one voxel per GPU or something like this. So, you know, like, uh, you know, if you can just shed some light on, you know, like ba basically a on long, long range sparse communication. And B, you know, like, why is this a message passing? Why not to do something like more trivial? Because, you know, your system is extremely regular. Right. No, the e excellent questions. Um, to the long range interactions point, yes, that's precisely what I would imagine if, if you asked me today to, to, build, to build this with long range electrostatics. Yes, it would be to take advantage of the extremely fast, you know, whatever it is, N log N particle mesh Ewald approaches in combination with some sort of prediction of partial charges, that's where it gets a little bit hairy. If you want to just assign them, you're done. I can, you can do that today. I like, I can send you a two line lamp script to add, you know, an Ewald term with partial fixed partial charges on top of an Allegro model. That's easy. If you want to do some sort of dynamic global charge equilibration, it gets harder. The best methods I know of have only been demonstrated in print uh, in practice using n-cubed algorithms 
Um, in principle, they've said, you know, there's a very nice paper, the fourth generation neural nets by Jörg Baylor's group that discusses this. In principle, they say it can be done using matrix-free methods in, I, I forget what the asymptotics then become, whether it's n log n or linear, I don't remember. Um, but as far as I know, this has never actually been done. Um, there are some linear scaling schemes um, where the, the communication overhead would be minimal, absolutely practical. I think that's a great approach. Um, I just, as far as I know to date, nobody has actually built the infrastructure for that or demonstrated that these charge equilibration schemes work on large systems. They've demonstrated for like small molecules in vacuum. Um, but I, as far as I know, nobody has applied that to like a full box of protein and water and seen if anything sane comes out when, you know, you add or remove one proton somewhere on the protein and whether that just like radically changes the entire box of waters. Like, I, I don't, I don't know that anyone has looked into this. It, I, I may just not be aware of the paper, but absolutely. I think that's the way to go. And again, if you want fixed charges, if you want to just take the partial charges out of Amber, you know, this is all in lamps. Lamps has a great PME implementation. You can just put it together. You're done. Like you can do that today. Um, and it's very interesting that the example you bring up with the capsid, uh, that's, that's probably a very nice example of like extremely long range electrostatics being very important. To your second point, um, yes, in principle, some sort of voxelization like this, absolutely um, a way that you could do message passing, a sort of multi-scale approach inspired by PME, certainly. Um, the complexity will be high. More importantly, I think, you know, even if you have like infinite engineer hours to build it, you'll still impose a communication overhead and you won't have true message passing in this case, right? You will have some sort of pooling. So there's some, there will be some uncontrolled difference to the baseline message passing network. So you, maybe you can train that away. Maybe it turns out to be no problem for accuracy, but I mean, I can't say that with confidence since it would be actually changing the model itself. Um, moreover, to me, the, the important point is that I think, again, we know what the long range physics looks like in these systems. We don't know what the short range physics looks like, but we know how the long range physics looks like. We know what dispersion and electrostatic terms look like. We even have a very good sense of what, you know, a physically meaningful charge equilibration model looks like. To me, it makes more sense. It's not just compensating for a deficiency if you don't have message passing. To me, it makes more sense to approach this with the physics, with the scale separation in, you know, reciprocal space which is the way that makes sense to do long range interactions. You know, message passing, again, you know, in the broader message passing literature, we have all of this discussion of over smoothing, all these things. Like, I don't think it's actually obvious that even if you could perfectly parallelize message passing with no overhead and no cost, that this would necessarily actually still even be what's the thing that makes more sense. Um, that's maybe a more, you know, sort of philosophy intuition point. Um, but I don't think, I don't view getting rid of message passing as a price we pay for scaling. I view it as a, a simplification and a reduction in the case of Allegro of the sort of equivariant model to its most fundamental part, which is the iterated tensor product of geometry with much less auxiliary noise. Um, Time will tell, of course, you know, if somebody does an experiment where it turns out that you know, message passing really captures something with, with ease that that is really difficult to get in other ways. But certainly at present, I I view it as getting rid of things we don't need, not paying a price. 